Hey everyone, welcome to PWR Instagram Live with Vashti Harrison. Vashti, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to chat about the work and I'm curious if anyone out there has seen it in person because I have not seen the globe out in in the real world. So I'm excited to to chat with you today. Oh, well, thank you. I'm, I'm thrilled that you're here. And I wanted to give a quick introduction so that um, we can tell more about your work. Uh, Vashti is a author, illustrator, filmmaker, a creator, really. And uh, you may know of her number one New York Times bestselling books, there's Little Leaders, Little Legends, there, there are so many. Um, you may have seen her uh, illustration. Yes, perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Vashti. Almost you like I have them around her. me all times. <laughs> I love it. The, the characters must live with you. Um, so, uh, so, Vashi is really a storyteller, and um, and quite a bit of her work is in uh, kid lit or children's books. But um, it is really uh, an incredibly imaginative perspective that anyone can enjoy. Uh, I certainly enjoy reading the uh, little leaders to my children and. That was my first introduction to your work. And so um, so we were really thrilled when you accepted the commission to be one of the artists on The World Reimagined and to, to paint one of our globes. So today we're gonna talk about your work, uh, your work within The World Reimagined and just um, what you hope to achieve with this project. And also we're going to open it up to our public. If there's anyone that has questions, please type them in and we'll try to answer them towards the end. But um, let's, let's dive in. Let's start, Vashti, with your storytelling ability because that is something that I think so many people are just in awe of how you bring us into these little worlds or big worlds or imaginative worlds or realities. So please, would you tell us more about how you do that? Yeah, it's interesting. When I was a young person, when I was in high school, I was entirely insecure about my writing. I thought that I was a bad writer, um, so much so that I, I was crying about not taking, um, about having to take a, an AP level, like a college level English course in my senior year, because I was, you know, I was in all of these other college level courses and I was so scared that I would be so bad at this class that the summer before school even started, I was crying myself to sleep, worried that I would do so poorly. And so I ended up not taking that writing class or that English class. Um, and what that meant was I went to college without my English credit and so I had to take that class anyways. And fortunately, because everyone has to get this English credit, there were all these different options. I went to the University of Virginia, and so you could take your English writing requirement on different things like rock and roll, on politics, on, on lots of different things. And the one that I ended up in was about movies. And I had never thought of myself as someone who knew anything about movies before, but I realized like once I, started examining them and getting interested in the idea of storytelling, the idea of movie making as function, as like art making as function, I became less afraid mm -hmm. of my writing because I felt like I had something to say. And so that's just to say that in my work all the time, I often feel anxiety and fear about not being able to do something the best way possible. But when I know that I have a story to tell or something to say or something that I want to express, I'm able to kind of find the right route there. And so um, I never thought of myself as someone who would become 
an author and illustrator of children's books and definitely not like a historian or anything, but I felt really passionately about um, sharing the stories of African American women in history. And so I was able to kind of find the route to write and publish my first book. Um, and so it's sort of like that with every single project. Um, in regards to the world reimagined, I had no confidence that I had the capability of painting a piece of public art, something so big. But I realized, you know, what's so special about public art is that people interact with it. And that's an interesting, um, interesting thing that, you know, I don't necessarily get to experience through making books, you know, books tend to be a bit more private. You can curl up with them at night. They're sometimes bedtime stories. But then when artwork is out in the world, you get to kind of examine it and experience it um, in a time and place when you maybe you weren't thinking about engaging in art. And I think that there's something so unique about that. So I was imagining like maybe the little kids that would like run up to it and, and how they would view it from a lower angle and how adults might look at it from a higher angle. And so what I'm interested in is engaging with people. And and obviously the like the concept behind the world reimagined is a really powerful one. And I, I wanted to think about how I could approach that through an inviting piece of art to to engage with people so i think that storytelling is usually the the mechanism behind the different media that i i work with um but i i approach it so differently than i you know i thought a storyteller was when i was a little kid you know i thought that i had to be mm -hmm. you know an immaculate writer and someone with the you know a desire to <laughs> write in poetic language um but it, it came well, to me in different ways. The irony, so. <laughs> the irony is that we actually think you are an immaculate writer. So, <laughs> so you are your harshest critic because we love the work. So, um, and, and particularly the work that, um, that we received as the world reimagined. We, um, we just were kind of, um, it was heart stopping when we saw your initial proposal for your globe. It really just, it, 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 it was like you could hear a pin drop, but you know, it was so impactful. And so I wanted to just read the quote that you submitted with your design um, because it was such a profound and um, really, it felt like a deliberate choice and and for for an african american it felt i felt seen and that's a, a a lot of what the world reimagine is about how do we make this world so that everybody feels seen and so here is the quote it is from the essay written by poet langston Hughes. the name of the essay is the negro artist and the racial mountain he writes, we build our temples for tomorrow, strong as we know how, and we stand on top of the mountain, free within ourselves. So one of the things that, that Langston Hughes, which is one of the greatest poets of the 20th century, really engages is this idea of cel celebrating Blackness. And um, for anyone who knows the world reimagine and how we have created a conceptual framework for understanding the history, the theme that Vashti was responding to is and still rewrites. And so this, this theme has uh, an uplifting outlook of celebrating this culture, this history. And so Vashti, I'd love if you could walk us through how did you come to this quote and then how did you visually interpret it? Yeah. Uh, so I originally came across the quote, quote when I was doing research for the third book. I wrote mm -hmm. Little Legends, Exceptional Men in Black History. And I was trying to find information about artists through other artists' eyes. And I found this mm -hmm. essay by Langston Hughes. 
Um, and in it, he's making the case for, you know, he's, he's kind of being a little bit shady. He's talking about another poet friend of his who didn't want to be viewed as a great black poet. He wanted to be viewed as a great poet, period. And he was arguing that, well, you can't separate your blackness from who you are. And so you should mm -hmm. own your blackness. And uh, he goes into uh, describing how other black artists are utilizing their perspective, their unique perspective as people who are American and black and, and focusing on our people and our culture and trying to uh, find the beauty in it. And so he talks about links and he, he talks about Aaron Douglas and he talks about Augusta Savage and um, County Cullen. And I think he's writing about County Cullen actually. Um, and so what I thought of when I was first asked to participate and thinking about still we rise, I was thinking about, okay, well, and an easy entry point for me into thinking about leaders and people who have um, accomplished things is clearly I've written and illustrated many of these books about about leaders in history. So I could be quite literal and I could just do portraits of these incredible people. But I what I really love is the way that these artists, especially the artists of the Harlem Renaissance, who were uh, taking a particular perspective as an act of resistance to view black as beautiful. Um, so Aaron Douglas is probably one of my favorite artists of all time. And so my first thought was like, man, it would be so cool if a globe could look like it was painted by Aaron Douglas. Um, and I went back to that quote because I, back to that essay, because I wanted to read about how uh, Langston Hughes described his work. Um, and there's like a, a, a line in that essay that I love so much that I want to make work about in the future. And I kind of read through it again and I realized that that last line has such a really incredible visual, um, just imagery. Um, and so I thought, you know, what would be really interesting is to, to take up sort of the perspective of these artists who were trying to reimagine and reconnect themselves with essentially Mother Africa, which is another theme along the journey of discovery of the, the world we imagine. They were trying to reconnect the, themselves with who they were, with their ancestry, after having been severed from it. And, and mm -hmm. the, the power in making the work that Aaron Douglas was making at a time when, you know, people were still suffering and struggling. Um, I thought that that's, there's something so powerful about the, like, the act of, it's such an act of resistance to try to create something that feels hopeful and while being still um, honest with the experience. So while Aaron Douglas's paintings are beautiful, you know, they're depicting the, you know, the middle passage and, uh, you know, breaking free of chains and he's, he's incorporating this sort of graphic style that is a mixture of like, hieroglyphics and art deco. He's using the, the style of the period that he's currently in and trying to imagine uh, a world that he had never participated in. And so I think that there was something so unique about that, especially being the only American to participate in this uh, incredible project. I thought, well, who, if this is a, an arts foundation reimagining England's role in the transatlantic slave trade. What do I, what can I as an American bring to that perspective? And so bringing all of those things together, I thought about how um, we could still think about how we can rise, how uh, we can connect with um, this culture, this heritage that had been, that we had been stripped from as Americans and and how to think about the future. And so I I thought how might Aaron Douglas or uh or any other artist approach the idea of building something for tomorrow, of of lifting up children and creating a future that feels hopeful and honest and um respectful for for you know, future generations. So all of those things came together into something that I, 
you know, I, I wanted to approach as like, man, I wish I could be like a, a fine artist. I wish I could be a graphic artist, but I really love um, making work that feels like it's for children. And I thought, you know, it would be really special is, um, you know, I could draw these strong, powerful figures like Aaron Douglas, but I wanted to make my characters, my protagonists, children, because in in every sense of the words, they are our temples for tomorrow. They are the things that we want to build up and we want to, to raise up. Um, so initially I was like, <laughs> I had no idea how I was going to imagine my drawing, but I, I did this, um, I did a, oh, I can't even show it. I did a three-dimensional oh, drawing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll spin it around and then you can see it. Okay. So I, I had very little time, so I just sketched everything out and I was like, I think this might work and I guess I got to get up on a plane soon. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Um, this was this was a pretty, uh, a pretty tight timeline, uh, but you succeeded so wondrously. And just for the, yeah, that's perfect, but to give a, a little bit of a sense for the people who are not able to um, make it to, to the trails, the trails will close on the 31st of October. And um, Vashti's Globe is in London. And um, I, just to, to describe it, um, you saw a little bit of what Vashti was showing, but you see young people, um, brown children that are climbing up quite playfully up this hill and um, and reaching the top some are, are at the top of the hill and and looking out and I have to tell you actually I had such a powerful moment because before all of oh there we go we can <laughs> see some of those children yes oh I love them they um as always with Vashti's work you recognize those images of the, the children. You can see yourself and um, as, a, as a black person, I see myself and as, you know, as a mother, I see my children in those children that are climbing the hill. But I wanted to tell you that um, the, in the week before the, the launch, all of the London Globes were in front of, or in, in the back of uh, Westminster Abbey in Dean's Yard, which is a, a large, Square um, where all 43 were, and uh, two um, two people came to your globe, and they had very different backgrounds. Um, I think they were from different countries. It was a man and a woman. Um, I think they were different religions. They were just so different, and they came to it, and they both really were so drawn to your globe. And one of them came away saying. Oh, I just, it was so uplifting. And I just felt so much love for these children. And the other one came away and said, wow, I felt so um, devastated in a way by this, uh, by this image because I could see the innocence of these children and what they were up against moving forward and what their future was holding. And so that to me is one of the incredibly powerful parts of this project and, and that I think you really brought to this project, this, um, that we did enter a world and, and it, it relates, like you said, to Mother Africa, but it also relates to our last theme, which is reimagine the future. And, um, and as you are trying to figure out what that means to you. I think our audience is figuring out what that means to them. And, and that dialogue between the globe and the audience was just incredibly powerful. Um, so I just thought I'd share that story with you because it, it really, it, it hit me quite hard to see how this, um, how this experience was for our audience. Um, that's amazing, yeah. It, that's really, it really was. It's really so special because, uh, I, I really didn't get to spend too much time with the globe when it was finished. I finished it, I think at four o'clock in the morning and I had to go to the airport for eight o'clock. And so it, I finished it and then I was just gone. So um, 
it's it's so nice to be able to hear these stories of, of people viewing it and, and there are some people here who said that they've seen it and I love people tagging me in any of the photos because a, a work changes when it's in a different place and when it's outside or when you're experiencing it um, when it's sort of unexpected and I think that's so special that these people were engaging so actively with it because again mm -hmm. if you hadn't heard the backstory if you hadn't read my artist statement maybe you didn't you wouldn't know and so it would look like just children maybe climbing up a hill and there's a futuristic city in the future but other people thought it looked like a castle and I thought well that's interesting it could look like you know a, a, a Walt Disney castle or something um, but I, I I wanted through the colors and through the texture to just for it to feel engaging and hopeful while also within the context, within the context of the rest of the entire project, you know, what is, what is hopeful mean? Um, what is hopeful mean mm -hmm. for children right now um, when maybe we haven't created a hopeful future for them yet? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really, that's really special. It was, it was a real moment. I mean, you have spoken just um, briefly about some of the challenges, but I love, I think, I personally feel like I grow through my challenges. This project was a big challenge for me. <laughs> and I grew through um, my role as artistic director. Was this project challenging or if so, how? Yeah, it, it absolutely was challenging. I think from a, I think just from an artistic perspective, I've never painted anything quite so big before. I, I was very unfamiliar with the materials. I think I painted a little bit in, in college, but you know, I primarily work as a digital artist. I'm working on the iPad, I'm working on my computer, and I have the beautiful tool known as the undo button. And I can just like <laughs> make my sketches and just make mistakes and then erase them if I need to. Um, this required a different, you know, thought process. I needed to be a little bit more mindful of my choices. Obviously, um, acrylic paints are, are, are very forgiving in that if you make a mistake, you can mm -hmm. um, just paint over top of it. But I think I had the mental block of feeling like, I don't know if I can do this. But, um, you know, I thought it was important to, to come to London, to come and work on it in person, to touch the globe and not just try to do a digital version and have it, um, you know, applied on. I think the, the physicality of a piece of public art is, is really unique and special. And then obviously it means something different when you can view it from those different angles, when you can pretend you're a little kid looking at it from below. And, um, and so that was really unique. And then the thing that I think was the most special was that I got to work on it in a space next to other artists working on their globes and the conversations that we got to have, um, and just seeing their process um, was so, <laughs> was really incredible and inspiring. I, um, I had to devise a method to make things a little bit easier for myself. So, you know, by the time that I got to putting all the children on, I was like, I cannot just like, just start going, just start painting on this thing. Um, and so I used um, tracing paper and I sketched out, I think you can, it's, I sketch out a, a decent amount of my characters and I place them on the globe and I kind of move them around to see if everything would fit properly. I wanted to kind of cheat the perspective a little bit um, to make it look like uh, things that are lower and are closer to us in the foreground. And as we go higher, it's kind of receding into the distance. Um, and so I needed to be able to <laughs> make sure that everyone was the right size. Um, so guys, um, so yeah, it. and then there were people who were next to me who were just like, just painting. <laughs> I was like, wow, look at you guys go <laughs> over here. I'm just uh, mulling over every single choice. Um, you know, the, the, the shape of the globe is a challenge um, around objects. You know, you think you're drawing something that's, you know, essentially a straight line or you have a, a general idea of where you think it's gonna go and then you step back and it, 
some suddenly something that was concave when you were standing up close to it now looks convex when you step back. And so that mm. was a very odd kind of optical illusion. So it required a different type of pacing. Um, and so, you know, that was a very kind of humbling um, experience. Um, uh, Donna Newman, who is a incredible muralist and person who paints lots of different types of sculptures, sculptures shaped like animals and Tyrannosaurus Rexes. <laughs> uh, she was an incredible guide to me um, when I first got started. And I, I had um, just like a lot of questions when I got started. And so it was really helpful to have someone around who knew um, what to do. And I, I, I that was invaluable. Um, and her globe, she oh, so she's a master, and she painted her globe, and it came out beautiful. Um, uh, so yeah, I think mm -hmm. the like the artistic challenges and then the creative challenges are are slightly different. In that, um, I was thinking about the narrative, how like you might travel around the globe, you might start at one point, and how your eyes might be drawn up mm -hmm. towards something else, um, and how to kind of engage people from all different angles. I think, you know, if I had it to do again, I would think a little bit more about how, um, you know, but about my different focal points, I would have maybe tried to fill it up with a few more things, but um, I, I really enjoyed um, the process of kind of trying to translate my style into this new medium. Um, I struggled mm -hmm. for a little bit, <laughs> but I think I eventually got there. You did. You you hundred percent got there, and um, we we think the globe is perfection. For anyone who wants to see it, you can go to Vauxhall Gardens, Vauxhall Pleasure Gardens. It's a five minute walk from the tube st tube station in London, the Vauxhall Tube. Um, if you are in the UK, I highly recommend going to see it. It is a incredibly special piece. Uh, we have just a few minutes left. And so I, there's a question, we can end on a, a viewer's question, which is, are there any stories you're keen to tell next through your imagery? Um, you know, I think I've spent a lot of time in, in my career as a children's book author and illustrator um, oh, Donna's here. There she is. Eden Designs Murals. Go, <laughs> just go check out her account to see all the incredible things that she paints. Um, I think I spent a lot of time in my career trying to um, tell the stories of people and history. So I always have a starting off point. I always have sort of a pinpoint in history um, to then expand upon and share either through um, these nonfiction stories that I've written um, and mm -hmm. illustrated or or even illustrating other people's things. Um, there are, even, even in the work that I made as a filmmaker, it was often about my family and folklore and stories that we tell mm -hmm. each other. Um, and so what's often really frightening for me is starting from something brand new. Um, and so there are stories that I have and that I'm interested in telling, but, um, you know, I really want my work to be meaningful for, for young people, for young black and brown children in America. And so I'm often thinking about, well, what will benefit the people I'm making this book for? Because that often gets left out of this, the discussion. Like sometimes people will be like, well, I think this would be a good children's book because kids need to know about this. And I think that's perfectly fine. But, you know, I, I think as a creator, I really try to keep my mindset into the perspective of, of who I was like as a kid and, and what kids are interested in. And so I really want to make work that they care about and they're not being, um, you know, that's engaging for them. I think that's why I care yeah. so much about, um, you know, my work being accessible. And, and honestly, when I was a little kid, if it wasn't pretty, I didn't pick it up. So I made my, <laughs> I didn't make my books super cute because I wanted kids to be interested in them, whereas history was not interesting to me. Um, this, the next book that I'm working on is really about um, 
something that has been kind of an undercurrent throughout all of my work and it's it's about innocence it's about the adultification of children of black children um and so i really am, am excited that i'm i've written my first fiction book which is terrifying <laughs> and anxiety <laughs> inducing but you know i i i want through these things that i draw these little adorable children i want them to remind people that children deserve innocence, that they deserve care and they deserve love because it's often something that black children are not afforded um, or, or even given the opportunity. I, she's not here, but this, this little group of children, there is a fourth one whose who's image is missing. Um, they're kind of in in my globe as a on the background kind of in in silhouette and you wouldn't know it but these are plus one uh the four little girls it's my my just a, a small nod to the four little girls who died in um the church bombing um mm -hmm. and I, I just often think about how black and brown children in america are, are not given this opportunity to, to be children long enough. Um, and so that idea of innocence, while it's an undercurrent, an undercurrent in all of my work, um, speaking to it directly in, in a story that I've written has probably been the most challenging thing for me, um, but it is the next thing that I've been working on. So hopefully I'll be able to share more about it soon. Um, but yeah. I, I'm excited to be able to expand my work into different media, and I'm grateful for uh, the World Reimagined for forcing me to do something I thought I would never do. <laughs> and now I'm like, oh, well, maybe I could paint a new globe and paint something else. I just heard that um, in New York City, they've launched a sculpture trail to support and raise money for jaguars. And I was like, oh, maybe I could have painted a jaguar. <laughs> So yeah, I'm excited to kind of push my push my creative boundaries um, because I, I seriously don't think of myself as just, um, you know, one type of artist. I think of myself as a multimedia artist and I'm interested in being able to share a story in the best way possible to engage with the, the best audience possible. And right now it's mostly children. So um, whatever gets them interested, I'm really, you know, I can get behind. Well, that is the perfect place to conclude this IG Live. Vashti, thank you so much for your participation in the World Reimagine. We are eternally grateful for your energy, for your globe, for your thoughtfulness. And um, I know that the other artists who were in the studio with you really felt uh, very connected to you and your globe. And so we're grateful for how you created community in that space. And we look forward to what's coming next. And again, I encourage all of our viewers to please go and see Vashti's globe and, and other globes that are in our trails across our host cities. You can keep on getting updates on our Instagram and on our website, theworldreimagined.org. Thank you again so much, Vashti. Thank you. you. Thanks for having me. Thanks everyone for joining. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks, thanks to our, our wonderful audience. It's been a pleasure. Bye, Vashti. Bye okay, everyone. Take care. Bye. -bye.